2023 was a massive year for me, for Sandbox News, and for the Air Power series. Not only were we nominated for seven international awards, including Aerospace Reporter of the Year, but we even managed to take one of those trophies home that you can see behind me for my coverage of the Army's decision to purchase the V-280 Valor from the Defense Media Awards held in Washington, D.C. just a few months ago. But awards aren't really why we do this job. We do this sort of work because we want to participate in the discourse about defense technology and deterrence, and it's been a great year for that as well. Our air power analysis has been cited multiple times by the Congressional Research Service in 2023 alone, including their in-depth analysis into the complications of transferring fighter aircraft to Ukraine, as well as their analysis into renewed great power competition and what that means for conflict in the Pacific. My analysis of Russia's S-400 Triumph air defense system and its real capability set were even cited by Dr. Christopher Yu and the Air Force's peer-reviewed journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs and their analysis of the escalatory attraction of a limited nuclear engagement. Now, yeah, I am bragging a bit here, but in truth, it means the world to me that these legitimate and respected academic and military institutions see our work as credible and use our work to help inform their own analysis. Now, as proud as I am of these accolades, the truth is the best part of 2023 for me was the incredible conversations I got to have with some awesome subject matter experts, a lot of which got left on the cutting room floor because it didn't apply directly to any of our episodes of Air Power. So I thought that we could close out 2023 by going back through some of these conversations to share some of the incredible tidbits and anecdotes that didn't make it into previous episodes of Air Power, but are just too good Good not to share. And where better to start than with Don Bentley, who's not just the best-selling author responsible for the latest book in the Tom Clancy Jack Ryan universe, Weapons Grade, which you can see right back there, but he's also a former U.S. Army Apache helicopter pilot turned FBI special agent who spent time on the FBI's SWAT teams and specialized in counterintelligence. Don Bentley knows his stuff, and that's what makes his writing so entertaining to read for a defense tech nerd like me. Now, I interviewed Don all about the hypersonic aircraft featured in his book, Weapons Grade, but during our conversation, I also got to hear some incredible stories about his days flying the Apache helicopter. And he offered a very valuable reminder of why all of us are capable of making mistakes even the highly trained aviators responsible for operating some of the most advanced combat systems on the planet. Here's Don. Aviation is a dangerous business, and the reason why you get flight pay is because it is so dangerous. And so what, what typically happens, um, for at least for Army aviation, is it seems like around the 250 to 500 hour mark, you try and kill yourself as a pilot because you have gained enough confidence in the airframe at that point that you feel comfortable, but you really aren't um, as good as you think you are. I think for lack of, when, when I teach my kids how to drive, which goes about as well as you would expect having a dad teaching a 16 year old to drive, I say, you know, it's not about reactions. It's about having the foresight to understand what the cars in front of you are going to do and be able to keep yourself out of a situation that's going to go south rather than to react to one. And aviation is the same way. And for me, that moment happened flying cross country. So Apache pilots are really good at blowing stuff up. We're not so good at flying cross country, entering traffic patterns and airports. And usually when Army aviation comes into a big airport, I actually flew into Holloman and uh, we didn't enter the traffic pattern backwards, but we entered the wrong side. And so I found myself flying formation with an F-117 that I think was probably as big a surprise to him as it was to me. But this um, this occasion, I was, I was a new pilot and I was coming into this major airport. I think it was El Paso. And so I was very, very nervous. I was chalked two or three and I was just trying to find follow my wingman. I really didn't understand where we were landing because with helicopters, they don't want you to clutter up the main runway. And so they vector you to some part of the airport because they think, well, you're a helicopter. You can just land on a postage stamp. And so we came down and I remember looking out my window, following lead. And he came to a high hover and he scooted over and he said, I'm just going to put it here. We were you know, somewhere close to the um, 
to the uh, aviation um, administration building there, the FBO. And so I looked at him, saw that I had enough um, room to, to come down and started coming down. In Apaches, there's no chin bubble. There's no way to see the ground below you. You have to actually lean out and look over what's called the FAB, the forward avionics bay. And I didn't do that. I just assumed that if he sat down there, he was leaving enough room. And as I was coming down, like, thank God, my back seater. So there's two sticks. There's the cyclic, which makes you go left and right, back and forth. And the collective, which gives you up and down. And as I was lowering down, and I'm still looking right to make sure I have a gap, the, the, the collective almost jumps out of my hand because my back seater hit it up so hard. And I looked down, and there was a Marine Cobra right underneath me that had a bunch of Marines working on. And I almost landed on them and would have killed us and probably killed them. And it was, you know, it was just such a stark reminder. It wasn't even a mission. It wasn't even a day that was supposed to be hard. But I had let the simple thing get away from me because I figured I was a good enough pilot that I didn't need to, to clear the landing zone behind me or my headspace wasn't. it. And that's in most aviation accents, when you go back and they do the safety debrief, there's a chain of events that happen that that in what aviation safety officers will tell you is that if you can interrupt that chain further on, you prevent the catastrophic um, ending. And, and it was almost catastrophic for me over something stupid. If I were to describe Don Bentley in one word, it would be humble. And I think that has a lot to do with his time in uniform flying the Apache in combat. You see, as Don explained in our conversation, one of the most important things a military aviator needs to be is brave enough to fail. Here's Don explaining what that means. People go in the military for lots of different reasons. I went in the military to be able to do something that there was no way I'd be able to do anywhere else. And so flying an Apache helicopter, I had this 30 millimeter chain gun that was slaved to my eye and anything I looked at, I could pull the trigger and it would go away. And that's a pretty good gig right there. I remember the first time in Afghanistan where I was shooting actually for another weird um, set of circumstances is I was shooting for a special forces a team and they were, and it was just so they could get used to calling in um, Apaches. It was, you know, a right across the river in Bagram. We were just shooting at targets and the voice on the radio sounded familiar. And the guy's like, Don, is that you? And it was a guy I had gone to college with that was now the a team leader. I was shooting rockets over his head and that kind of stuff only can happen in the military. And especially in aviation, most days I couldn't believe they paid me to do that. I will say to kind of echo Bob is that you don't have to be a special person from the standpoint of some innate aviation gift. Like the instructors in flight school can teach monkeys how to fly if, if you're willing to listen to, to learn and to do the work. And I was um, probably more on the monkey scale than on the pilot scale um, to begin with. And I think you know, having the courage or the way I would I would add something to Bob's answer is being brave enough to fail and to, by trying the really hard things and knowing that it's not going to be easy and you're probably not going to do it right the first time. When I was in flight school, there's a, a rite of passage for Apache pilots where you learn how to fly the system. And so in addition to having that gun slave to your eye, your eye is actually cued to a sensor at the front of the helicopter. And so the way you fly at night is as you turn your head, that sensor um, turns. And so you see the infrared image from that sense in one eye, and you use your left eye to look inside the cockpit and see the, the gauges and stuff. And so learning how to fly, it was called flying the bag, because you would actually, they would take black trash bags and tape it over the window so you couldn't see outside, and it would force you to use just that one eye to fly. And it was one of the hardest things I ever did. I actually failed my progress ride during the first part of it and had to go back and get extra hours and stuff and do it again. And when I, for Army aviators, I'm sure it's, um, it's a little bit different for the Air Force because so many of their pilots are single pilot aircraft, but it's a big deal when you take your pilot and command ride the first time. You have to get a couple of instructor pilots to recommend you. It goes before a board, you're practicing everybody in your unit knows you're going up for your pilot and command ride. And I failed mine the first time. And it was this huge blow to my ego. It was this, I could have been like, ah, commission guys don't usually make pilot and command. I gave it the good college try. And I went back and 
eventually passed it again and was a pilot in command in Afghanistan. And so there were so many good things I did in aviation that were hard that require you to be willing to work hard and be willing to try things you're probably going to fail at the first time. Because to Bob's point, if it was easy, everybody would be an astronaut. And I think that is the, the cue. You know, I've had before, I'm an engineer, Bob's an engineer. I've had a lot of people say, hey, I want to be a, a pilot, so I'm going to be an engineer. You don't have to be an engineer to be a pilot, but you got to be good enough to get selected. Because now, when I went through, they didn't have the, the um, operation to be able to make your eyes 20-20. And so that was a real easy way to med board people out. Now, you know, they, you have to be even that much better because you can have your eyes, uh, you know, turned into 2020 vision. And so that would be my, I, I would not trade the 10 years I spent flying for anything, but at the same time realize it's not easy. And if you want to get the most out of it, you have to have courage and you have to be not afraid to fail. Now, Don's book features a hotshot SR-71 Blackbird pilot who comes out of retirement named Bob Baylor, who just so happens to be based on a very real man named Major General Bob Baylor. And I was fortunate enough to get to interview him about his days in the Air Force. Now, General Baylor was an Air Force test pilot who logged hours in more than 65 different aircraft, including the U-2 spy plane and the SR-71, which he flew operationally. General Baylor went on to become the commanding general of the Air Force's Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Center out of Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. And of course, the first thing I needed to know when I met with General Baylor was, what was it like to fly the fastest air-breathing jet-powered crewed aircraft in history? Here's what he had to say. The airplane, what it felt like, it really flew in two very, very different regimes. The first regime is basically physical, like a big, heavy fighter airplane with no flaps. I, when I was a test pilot uh, school, uh, I got to fly the F-4, and one of the graduates' things you had to do is fly a no-flap, heavyweight F-4 pattern. And, you know, you were very careful, always watch an angle of attack, you know, you didn't have, a, you know, and the SR flies, that's the way it flies in, uh, in, a, uh, in a physical regime. But in a... And uh, the other regime is basically a cerebral. So once you push over and get that dipsy going, the star group is going supersonic, you transition from a physical airplane to a very cerebral sort of environment where you're, you're monitoring systems and there's a lot of systems. And, and then you, you, you start going through the mock as you're climbing up. Uh, and then you get at altitude and you, and you get into an area where you have to let the airplane fly on auto nav. I mean, as good as we were as pilots, when you're 15 miles above the surface of the earth and you're looking at a target at maybe 250 miles off your right or left side, you know, a, deg a degree change in bank angle is going to screw it up by miles. So when you're on an operational mission, you had to fly with the autopilot. And it would, be, it would feel like you're sitting in that seat right now. That's how smooth and calm it is because you can't have any vibration. It's pretty incredible. Um, and sometimes you get some perturbations in the atmosphere where it goes cold to hot. You can feel yourself going back and forth as a Mach number change a little bit, but you're just monitoring systems and not much time to look out the window. You know, that's the other thing. What's it look like up there? Well, I got pictures that prove it, but you know, you were locked inside and making sure that everything was working exactly the way it was supposed to. So it had it had a wartime mission, it had a peacetime mission, and it had a political mission. And I got to fly, you know, a couple of each of those things. And as you mentioned earlier, I, I one of the, you know, I think that this airplane probably inspired more youth to go off to be scientists, engineers, and pilots than any other airplane ever built. And I cannot count the number of times that once people found out I flew the SR-71, they come up and they said, that was the first airplane model I ever built. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, you know, pretty good. And the other thing, too, as I will say, that when I flew the airplane, I felt invincible. That's how, how much training and respect we had for this airplane. And I would say all the Habus, you know, we, we weren't up there, you know, wringing our hand. We knew that we were flying the world's most advanced airplane, highest flying, fastest. And we had a mission to do, and it was really, really important. 
Now, as we've discussed in past videos, one of the biggest advantages that U.S. military aviators have over adversary nations tends to be the amount of training that they undergo on their way to combat deployable units. But that doesn't mean that you can train for everything. So here's Bob talking about the SR-71 rocket ride, something he was never trained to do. There's a bunch of missions that I flew that never trained on. You know, one of, one of my most enjoyable flights was uh, out of uh, Kadena, Japan, in Okinawa. It was a real long mission, lots of air fueling, uh, going to certain parts of the world in uh, South uh, East Asia that we haven't been in a long time. But that wasn't the coolest part. The coolest part was uh, it was it was called a rocket ride. We never practiced this. We just, you know, they say, don't screw it up. And if you take off with maximum fuel on the airplane, which is about 80,000 pounds of fuel. So they were taking off at 140,000 total. And, um, you know, our takeoffs were not, we didn't call them takeoffs and landing. We called them launch and recoveries because it was much like a space launch. You know, we had umbilicals all over the place, lots of people running around and hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people all around the world, you know, getting ready for us to show up. Uh, but on the runway, you know, you get on the runway about two minutes before your launch time. And in about 60 seconds, you start pushing the power up to about 90, 80, uh, excuse me, 80 percent, because any more than that, the wheel, the tires would turn inside the wheels. And then when the time was zero, you released the brakes, went to full max afterburner. And on this particular rocket ride, uh, take off about 240 knots, pull the nose up 15 degrees, suck the gear up and just hang on for the ride. And and we we I went to uh, from brake release through the Mach uh, above eighty thousand feet and above Mach three in less than twelve minutes. So it originally was long for the ride. But, you know, just my job was to keep that angle of attack going and then level off. And then we flew for several more hours and about four every fueling before we came home. But that that's an example of you don't have a chance to practice that. You just do it. What a war story about, you know, you can actually fly too high in this airplane. You know, you can't get into orbit, obviously, but uh, the colder it gets, like if you're flying north of the Arctic Circle, it gets really cold up there in the wintertime, you know, much colder than a minus uh, 56 degrees. It could be 20 degrees colder than normal atmospheric pressure time uh, temperatures. And the way you fly the mission is you're always worried about fuel. You're always worried about not having enough fuel because you're going on this big loop and coming back, and there's nothing on the other side of that loop. You got to come back, so you're always monitoring that. And so, when you're flying, uh, you try to minimize afterburner because you have to fly cruise and afterburner. So, on a particular mission uh, going north, uh, the airplane was scheduled to go at Mach three in this mission, and it was very cold. And so, at minimum afterburner. You couldn't take it out after burn or it came down like a like a brick. Uh, it was still Mach 3. It was still climbing. So the question is, how high is it going to go? Uh, um, the mission was a stimulator mission, which I can't get into much detail, but it was to aim into um, some part of the world that would excite their, uh, their ground to air intercept capability. And it really didn't matter if I had sensors on or not. We just wanted to get, excite all that system. But turning into that and all of a sudden realize I don't have the aerodynamics because I was so high that, it, you know, you're not, not able to turn very much. So what I had to do, I had to continue the mission. And it's one of those things about a big boy mission is I started a, a descent and a turn, went to max afterburner and kept turning and lost about 10,000 feet in that turn and locked on the angle of attack indicator because you what always does very important because anything above eight degrees angle of attack and if you got what's called an unstart uh, in an engine that could make the aircraft go uncontrollable. So and the other thing turning into surface air missiles and descending is never a good idea. But uh, everything worked out, got back, and I had to abort the mission halfway through because I just I was going so high, I didn't have the aerodynamics. But that's another thing is that how do you practice that? You just read the book and say, I, I think I got, I got it figured out.
The truth is, I've got enough of these great clips to go on for days, but let's close with a conversation I had with my buddy Hazard Lee, who's a former U.S. Air Force F-16 pilot who flew wild weasel missions before transitioning to the F-35, where he had a significant role in establishing the F-35's training syllabus for new pilots. Now, as luck would have it, Hazard had a book come out this year as well, which you can see back there on the shelf just below Don's. He's also got a fantastic YouTube channel I highly recommend that you follow. Now, I was fortunate enough to get to talk to Hazard about all sorts of stuff on and off the record this year, but I thought to close out 2023, we could talk about one combat experience he had flying the F-16 that really exemplifies why he's so passionate about what he does. So we'll close out on this, and I'll see you in 2024. So my wingman and I, you know, we were on the night shift. We you know, walked in the squadron, first thing we would do is get an intelligence brief of what was going on uh, in the previous 24 hours, where troops were moving, where the enemy was uh, coming from, changes in tactics. And so midway through that that brief, uh, we were interrupted saying that there's, uh, you know, a big troops in contact situation. Like I said, there were only two aircraft uh, uh, airborne at any given time. And so this other two ship before us, they were running out of weapons. And so they needed us to launch right away. So we you know, ran to to go suit up. You know, you you transfer your M9 pistol to uh, your survival vest, and then uh, you go out into uh, to the jet. So, uh, went out there, took off. The, the interesting thing about when we were taking off. So, Bagram, I think I think you've been there, but you have these large, like fifteen thousand foot mountains around you. So, it casts a shadow really early. So, you're really kind of working in the dark, and so you can take off you know, around sunset uh, for where it is at Bagram. And then it's almost like blue skies uh, once you get airborne. So it's a pretty, pretty interesting uh, contrast. Um, but anyway, we were, you know, lit the afterburner um, and made our way towards Nangahar. It's the area tucked up against the, the Pakistani border. And so, uh, you know, as soon as we checked on the other two shift, they, they checked off, they were low on fuel and ammo. They pointed out a few things going on. And then, you know, we were, we were on station, other aircraft on station. There's a AC-130 and there was uh, several ISR aircraft, um, like uh, MQ-9 drones. Um, and so the troops, uh, they were, they were under fire. The AC-130 had been there for a while. They were, you know, getting low on their weapons. And then midway through, um, you know, the handover, the AC-130's radios completely went out. So they couldn't communicate at all with the troops on the ground. They were under a pretty bad firefight, and we were able to, to go in and uh, take out a lot of the uh, the uh, machine gun emplacements where the enemy was. So that was meaningful. Unfortunately, um, there was one um, Special Force soldier killed during that incident. So, you know, that was just a gut-wrenching feeling to hear that over the radio. They didn't say that he had died, but that he, uh, that, it, you know, what we heard was it was bad. It wasn't looking good. They called in the CASAVAC for that. So, um, you know, pretty sad day uh, losing a, a, a U.S. service member. Um, but uh, going back to, you know, service and, and a meaningful mission, we were able to to brunt the uh the attack from the uh, the ISIS fighters, and we were able to work with the uh, the KC-135 to their credit, or, or uh, the AC-130 to their credit. They were able to uh, continue suppressing the field that they were shooting at, even without the radio. So that was a pretty uh, uh, risky move on their part um, to be able to do that. And they ended up shooting every every uh, bullet on board. We were able to, to take out the compounds. That was our spe specialty with our uh, two thousand pound bombs. And then the army was able to play a role by uh, launching uh, high Mars, and uh, and uh, we were able to to decimate the enemy that day. And uh, fortunately, the uh, the U.S. troops were able to uh, the egress back to their camp. Mm -hmm.